Good morning. Let us worship God. Take our hands, O God, as we come to worship. It's so great to look out and to see you here. I expected about half this number. This is called Low Sunday, the Sunday after Easter. Uh, a lot of people stay home and say, ah, I was there last week. <laughs> so we're, we're glad that you are here. There are several things that I'd like to share with you. Uh, if you are a visitor, we hope that you feel loved and welcomed and that you will want to come back. And that goes for members and friends as well. Just a few things to share. Uh, one is that we lost a dear member of our church family, Dolores Estes, last week. She taught Sunday school. She's been active here for a very, very long time. And so our love and our prayers and our thoughts are with Keith, her husband, and, uh, and their family. And also, Brian Sullivan lost a friend, Joe Zeminski, this weekend. And so our thoughts are with you as well, Brian. God bless you. Joe sits up in the front every Sunday, and in the middle of the service, all of a sudden, he stands up and looks around. Uh, When he does that, we hope any children that are with us will go with him as he goes out that door. He's going to teach them uh, something about the Lord in Sunday school today. And uh, we'll be glad that you're here, and we hope you'll be glad that you were here as well. Uh, Steve Spencer, thank you. For the parking bumpers, there are some parking bumpers against the building and the side parking lot, I think five of them, and we're hoping that everybody will park all the way up to the bumper so that your back of your car won't be sitting out and make it difficult to pass. So uh, we're excited and thankful for that. And you might wonder where Herb is. Herb and Lorraine have taken the week off. They're visiting their son and his family in North Carolina. Herb says, I will be back. (laughs) He'll be back next week. And finally, um, we received a grant from the Jacobson Foundation. We're real excited about that. I want you to know that that any special gifts that you give to the church, if you write Jacobson Foundation on your check, it will be matched. There are matching funds. That means your gift will be doubled. And so we invite you to do that as well. So, again, God bless you as we worship God together. Please join me responsively as we read our invitation to celebration. I'll start with the leader part. We have been blessed with the arrival of another new day. Another new day filled with promise and potential. We have been given the gifts by our God to enable us to live this new day productively. But whether or not we do that is up to us. Let us then commit ourselves in our worship to active and devoted discipleship. We give all we are and have to the divine and pray for guidance in all we do.
together let us call upon God. God of all time and space, we gather here this morning and look ahead to our tomorrows. We know what the past has held and hope we have learned enough to do what you want and expect of us in the present. And as we work in the present, we look ahead to what can be, to what might be, to what should be, and trust that with your love and support, we can make a good difference in the world in which we live. Grant us all we need to make an impact as your followers and the will to do what must be done if your kingdom is to be established. So we pray, ending with the words of the one we seek to emulate. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May 
I sing thy praise forever and As the Lord has so richly blessed us, let us return some of that to him, and let us be generous in our morning offering.
Pray with me. Loving God, who in Jesus sent your life to earth and on Easter revealed your power over death, we bless you in the name of Christ our Lord. We cannot know the risen Christ as Thomas demanded to know him. We cannot touch the print of the nails in his hands or gaze at the wounds in his side but we can know him in the power of his resurrection. Jesus left us, but he did not leave us alone. Before taking his place at your side, he breathed your Holy Spirit on his disciples, enabling them to recall his words and deeds and to interpret them. That same spirit is still at work. Not only does it enable Christ to become our contemporary, it enables us to become contemporary with Christ. We do not have to envy those first disciples. For just as Christ became their companion on the Emmaus Road, he becomes our companion on the roads we travel. As he walked with them, he walks with us. And if we will only listen, he will talk with us. And if we will walk in his steps, he will claim us as his own. O Lord of heaven and earth, who was never more fully present with us than when you joined humankind in Christ, we love you and adore you for revealing yourself in Jesus as you were and are and evermore shall be. As we thank you for him, we thank you also for those who have kept his spirit alive, Their name may not be legion, but their presence is undeniable. As he gave himself to your mission, they give themselves to his mission. As he bore witness to the unity between you and humankind, they bear witness to the unity between Christ and the church. Yet our life as a Christian community has rarely moved outsiders to exclaim that we are one with Jesus. We have shared with them the message of Christ, but not our own welcoming countenance or even sometimes a warm smile. Forgive us, dear Lord, for this betrayal of those who come to us in search of bread for the journey. We feel guilty that our love has not been more apparent, more generous, that we have not offered them warmth or even been a brother or sister in Christ. As we intercede in prayer for these victims of our faithlessness, send us out to put life into our words and actions. Restore their faith in you through our demonstration of faith in them. Awaken us to your will that we may awaken them to your will. Renew your partnership with us so that your spirit will infuse our partnership with them. And let us and them, hand in hand with you and one another, go into the world to perform the mission to which Christ has commissioned us. Let us not forget that in faith as in life, we all rely on one another. Grant us the grace, dear Lord, So to represent you, that we will neither displease you nor mislead others. For we ask it in the name of our Savior, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. (laughs) 
and amen. There's a song that has been around for about 10 years that I think will eventually become one of the hymns of the church. You can find it on YouTube. You may have sung it in another place. On YouTube, if you see the pictures that accompany the the tunes of what you're looking up, it'll be a guy with his hands outstretched like this, a young guy. And if you play that, you will see that when it comes to the point, when the song comes to the point where speaking of the resurrection of Christ, the kids cheer. And it just gives you goosebumps to hear another generation cheering the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to share it with you, to teach it to you. I know that new hymns are not a fun thing, but maybe this will be fun for you. The words are inspiring, and I think the tune is beautiful as well. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. Eyes, let's sing that verse again. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless fame, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. (coughs) This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Thank you for singing that out. Awesome. Thank you. And our scripture for today 
comes to us from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John in the 20th chapter. It's a perfect scripture for the Sunday after Easter. Chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And as I usually do, I'll be sharing with you from the message, a different version of the Bible. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace be to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated this greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your fingers and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, so you believe because you've seen with your own eyes? Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. There are, these are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. May God bless to our hearts, our minds, our very lives, this reading of God's word that is true and can always be trusted. Amen. Comedian Bob Hope, who most of you will remember fondly as a wonderful entertainer, was married to his wife Dolores for 69 years, the longest Hollywood marriage on record. Bob lived two months past his 100th birthday. Dolores died at 102. I can tell I forgot something. We'll start there again. <laughs> Seems like I've done this before.
double amen. We would not have wanted to miss that. You, you know what would be a lot of fun would be some Sunday night to have a dinner and then to follow it with a hymn sing and do all Gaither songs. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be wonderful. Let's, let's put that down for something to do. Again, comedian Bob Hope, <laughs> who many of us will remember fondly as an entertainer, was married to his wife Dolores for 69 years. That's six nine the longest Hollywood marriage on record. Bob lived two months past his 100th birthday, and Dolores died at 102. Yeah. Dolores was a devout Catholic. Bob loved to talk about the time that she was on a commercial airline in which two priests were seating in front of her and three nuns were seated behind her. One of Hope's writers, Charlie Lee, was also on the flight, and he turned to Hope and he said, why can't she take out regular flight insurance like the rest of us? <laughs> I doubt that Dolores really believed that being surrounded by people of faith would keep the plane in the air, but she no doubt knew that keeping in the company of other believers would keep her faith in the air. She could have learned that lesson from the central character of our story, from today's lesson from the Gospel of John. He was known to his friends as Thomas Didymus, Thomas the twin. Jews in the first century were typically known by two names, one Hebrew name and one Greek name. For example, Peter was also known as Cephas. Cephas is Hebrew. Peter is Greek, Thomas is Hebrew, and Didymus is Greek. Didymus is Greek for twin. Thomas evidently had a twin brother. Now, sometimes we treat Thomas like a villain. He was no villain at all. In fact, Thomas was very much like you and me, or if not you, certainly like me. He was a realist. He knew that seeing was believing. Both his experience and his common sense told him that people who have been crucified, dead and buried, do not come back to life. No one had ever called from their cell phone in a sealed tomb. Dead people only walk around in Hollywood movies. Yet that's what his friends were saying about Jesus. They were saying that Jesus, whom he knew had been put to death by the Romans, was now alive. And Thomas just was not buying it. It's true that Thomas had seen Christ work many miracles. He had also heard him teach with great authority on the Holy Scriptures. There was no question in Thomas's mind that Jesus was no ordinary man. Thomas had hoped that he was the Messiah, the one who would come to redeem Israel. But how could the Messiah be put to death? How could he, who was supposed to save the Jews, be the one who was rejected by the ones he had come to save? It made no sense. Jesus died on a cross between two thieves. Many of Thomas's hopes and dreams died there on that cross as well. And now doubt and disillusion had set in. Thomas took no pride in his skepticism. Some people do. Doubt and skepticism are convenient tools for some people to help them to avoid commitment. I can say I doubt the truth of the resurrection and avoid all the unpleasant things that one must do as a follower of Jesus, like sharing the gospel with my friends, like serving meals to the homeless, like taking up a cross daily and following Jesus. But that was not true of Thomas. Thomas wanted to believe. It was just that he was afraid of being made a fool. Have you ever had someone let you down, really let you down? It's hard, really hard to trust in that person again, isn't it? Fool me once, we say, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Thomas had been willing to die for Jesus and for the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, but now Jesus was dead. What Messiah? What kingdom? 
he dared not allow himself to be suckered in again. Besides, he was not alone in his doubting. The other disciples had trouble believing as well that Christ was alive. When the women returned from the tomb and testified that the tomb was empty and the angels had told them what, what, that Christ had risen, the other disciples all dismissed it as an idle tale. They did not believe it. That first Easter evening, they were still cowering behind locked doors. They were still living in fear, not faith. And then Christ burst through those doors and revealed himself to them, and it was them. And only then did they begin to believe. Now it's a week later. For some reason, Thomas had not been there behind those locked doors when Christ first appeared to the others on that Easter evening. He really should be remembered not as doubting Thomas, but as absent Thomas. You know, it's always dangerous to miss church. You never know when Jesus is going to show up. (laughs) Thomas had not been there, but his friends had been. Why he could not accept their testimony, we do not know, but he didn't. Well, it was incredible. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his sides, he said to them, I will not believe And now they were behind locked doors once again. Even though they testified that Christ was alive, they still had not unlocked the doors. We've known Christians like that, haven't we? They say, oh yes, I believe in the resurrected Christ, but their lives are still a mess. If they believe with their brains that he is alive, they haven't told it to their hearts. No, Thomas wasn't the only one who was slow in accepting the good news of Jesus Christ. But suddenly Christ was in their presence again. And he came directly to Thomas and and he said, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. But as we read, we know that Thomas didn't need to reach out. He was stricken to his very soul when he saw Jesus' scars. Thomas's response was one of utter sincerity, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. And those words are directed to you and to me. For we are in the same boat as Thomas before he had that personal experience with the risen Christ. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We are more than 2,000 years removed from that room with locked doors, and yet we have that same resistance that Thomas had, the same natural skepticism. How can we believe, even though we were not there to see the scars or hear the words of, of reassurance that Christ spoke to his followers? What can we learn from Thomas about keeping our faith so vital and so strong that we are not forever cowering in fear behind locked minds. Well, the first thing that we can learn is to stay in the company of believers. Even if it was only coincidental, Dolores Hope was right to fly surrounded by people of faith. That's the best way to travel. Reverend Reverend Dr. Janet Childers is professor of homiletics and speech communication at San Francisco Theological Seminary. She tells about preaching at Allen Temple Baptist Church in nearby Oakland during a traditional African-American Good Friday service. This was an interesting service. She says the men of the congregation, including some younger males, were, the younger males were not quite teenagers, we're providing the special music for that day for the seven last words of Christ that were being preached by seven women preachers, Dr. Childers being one of those preachers. And the men were clearly getting a kick out of it. Dr. Childers knew that she would get a kick out of it too because she knew her sermon would be followed by her favorite baritone, Deacon Sellers, 
singing a song. She says it's all she can do to keep from tearing up every time she hears Deacon Sellers sing The Holy City. And this time she was glad that he was singing it after she preached and not before because it would be hard for her to preach with all those feelings that she had. Of course, there were not seven male soloists of the stature of Deacon Sellers who could get off from work on a Friday afternoon, even at a large and flourishing church like Allen Temple. And so it was that some of the young baritones in training were given their first outing at this service. She said that there was one young man who seemed to be 11 or 12 years old and his, his voice wavered through the first few bars of the assigned song, a good two blocks from the key that the organist was in. But the congregation was with him. All right now, said voices from the congregation. That's right, sing, child. Gradually, she noticed that the young man's voice began to strengthen and, and as he finally appeared to find the right key. The young voice was encouraged by the congregation's support, but there was something else going on. The boy's voice was being shadowed, it seemed, by a steady, secret voice. She looked around, and in the choir loft, a few yards behind the soloist, Deacon Seller sat there with his face pointed in another direction, he just happened to be there, you know, waiting his turn. And she looked again, and Deacon Seller's lips were moving. He was singing steadily, stealthily, singing that green 12-year-old into key. And gradually, she realized that there were four or five men scattered through the loft, also looking very casual, also singing. She realized that that young man was not on his own. He was being undergirded by these experienced men of faith. What a great example of what the church is supposed to be. If you want to keep your faith strong, if you want to have a support group that will be there with you in your time of need, this is where you will find it. Surround yourself by people of faith. That's one way to ensure that doubt and skepticism won't steal away your confidence in God. Here's the second Remember that a locked mind is a far bigger obstacle than a locked door. Thomas may have sounded like a firm skeptic when he stated that he would not believe unless he saw with his own eyes and touched with his own hands. But why was Thomas there if the others were the only ones who believed that Christ still existed and that Christ was alive. He could have stayed home and watched Sunday night football, but he was there with his friends. We know why he was there, because Thomas wanted to believe. There are plenty of people who would have stayed home. There are plenty of people who have locked their minds firmly against faith. Sometimes it's the result of unfortunate past experiences. Sometimes it's a guard against many, making any other kind of commitment. But for some people, it is a genuine intellectual decision. People reject Christ for all kinds of reasons. But what we need to see is that Christ will always honor their decision. He will not force himself on anyone. He will allow us to go our own way. But believe this, he will leave a light burning in the window so that when we come to ourselves, we can come home. I like the story about a well-known writer, Annie Dillard. Dillard grew up in Pittsburgh. She was a bright, well-read child and teenager with many questions about God, including the age-old question, why was there suffering in the world? And finally, all her questions led her away from God. So one day at the grand old age of 15, she took it upon herself to make an appointment with her aging pastor at the Shadyside Presbyterian Church. And she said to him, I want my name taken off the roll. I don't believe in God anymore. Pastor said, okay. And Dillard said, you're not gonna try to argue me out of it? And he said, oh no, 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 no. You're much too smart for me. There's no way I could argue you back in. So she said, well, I want my name off the roll. 
It's off the roll. Okay. She walked out of the minister's office and started her way down the hall. And then she heard him mutter to himself out loud, she'll be back. <laughs> Young Ann Dillard wheeled around and went back into the office. She said, what did I hear you say? He said, oh, I said, I presumed you'll probably be back. She said, look, this is my life. I live my life like I want to live my life. I'm not coming back. Well, Annie Dillard wrote in her life story, as I write this, I'm 48 years old and I'm back. <laughs> Most people, if they are presented with a healthy expression of the gospel and a loving environment while they are young, will come back. It's a matter of personal decision. And Christ respects our freedom. He will burst through the locked doors of a room where his disciples are hiding, but he will not burst into a locked mind. Three, still Christ wants us to know that we are loved. Just because Thomas doubted the gospel did not mean that Christ had stopped loving him. And Christ wants you and me to know that as well. That if we're having a difficult time believing the gospel, he hasn't stopped loving us either. And to me, that's what's beautiful about Christ's scars. There's an ancient fable about an Indian healer who cured a man of leprosy. He took away all the disfiguring marks of the disease, but he left the man with one small scar. What was the scar for? The healer answered, so he will always remember. Have you under, ever wondered why God left the risen Christ with wounds still on his body? The scarred hands and feet and the wounded side? After all, the New Testament teaches us that when God gives us new life beyond the grave, we're also given a new body, one that is whole and perfect and never dies again. We know that Christ had a new spiritual body because he entered the room without the doors being unlocked. Why then did his body retain the scars? I believe it was to remind us of God's great love for us. We may doubt, we may deny, we may betray every good value that God would have us embrace, but God never stops loving us. When Thomas saw Christ's scars, he cried out, my Lord and my God. Those scars told Thomas how much he was loved. Hymn writer Isaac Watts put it this way. He said, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Christ loves you. Christ died for you. Christ rose from the dead. And now he welcomes all who would come to his Father's kingdom. Are you ready to take that step? Praise be to God.